Welcome to Life in Biology. I'm Dr. Joel Graff, and this video is going to be about a special translation feature that viruses have. Oftentimes, viruses will do things slightly differently than a cell would normally do them, and you can learn a lot about biology by studying viruses. So we we're focusing on translation initiation, and I have a couple of slides here. Uh, a couple of drawings to compare where translation initiation occurs on a typical eukaryotic M mRNA uh, and that's there's a lot of different types of eukaryotes so let's say human RNA and then bacteria one big difference is that if you look at the two RNAs that I drew uh, this RNA has one rectangle drawn on it meaning that there is one protein coding sequence located with this within this RNA. There's a start site here, a stop site here. You translate the protein from there to there, and the rest of the RNA is just for regulation purposes. So in a bacteria, you'll notice that there are quite a few boxes drawn on top of this. And if you think back to the TRIP and LAC, LAC operons, uh, you will remember that they usually had one promoter sequence that was under control uh, that if, it, if transcription was turned on, a lot of genes were piled up right downstream of that promoter sequence. And so when you make an RNA, it's going to have multiple uh, protein coding sequences within uh, that RNA. Now on the eukaryotic RNA, we had this feature at the five prime end of the RNA called a cap. And we want one of the first eukaryotic initiation factors that helps translation initiation begin uh, is EIF4E. And that was the cap binding protein. And then that started the dog pile. The next protein was EIF4G. And then that was a, a really good uh, protein for amplifying that dog pile because EIF4G interacted with so many proteins. Eventually, you brought in the small subunit of the ribosome and it would scan until it got to the start site. And then that's when the large subunit of the ribosome would join in. And together, the small and large subunit of the ribosome would translate the protein and the eukaryotic initiation factors just kind of drifted off. Their job was done by the time you got to elongation. In bacteria, because you have multiple uh, protein coding sequences, it means that there, it would be handy if there's multiple places along the RNA where the ribosomes could bind. So I've got the small and large subunits of the ribosomes, and they're all coming down on this sequence in between each of these genes, these intergenic se sequences called the Shine Delgarno sequence. Now, Shine Delgarno sequences recruit in those. Uh, ribosomes and then the ribosomes can translate so right before each protein coding sequence here you've got a shine delgarno and then that brings in the translation machinery so you can get multiple proteins from a single RNA that's polycystronic whereas most eukaryotic RNAs are monocystronic and eukaryotic I mean human again there's a lot of variety in biology so there's uh, exceptions to every rule that I'll tell you. Um, so then the some of the viruses that we learned about are positive RNA viruses and if they're a positive sense RNA virus, uh, single-stranded RNA virus, they can serve as an RNA immediately when they get into the cell. And uh, so since they are uh, immediately able to be translated to protein, uh, we'll take a look at one of those genomes and the first thing we'll notice is that at the five prime end, this is, uh, I think it's poliovirus that I uh, basically copied the iris of. Very poor copy, but you get the idea there's a lot of secondary structure in the RNA. It has a protein at the five prime end instead of that cap structure that we're used to seeing at the five prime end. That protein is called VPG for viral protein genome linked. And in poliovirus, it's involved in virus replication along with that first kind of secondary structure you see of the RNA. 
Now the rest of the iris, the poliovirus iris, is going to be involved in translation initiation. And so if there's no cap, then there's no way that you can get uh, EIF4E, the cap binding protein. So you've taken EIF4E out of the picture. There is a, a stem loop structure here with a bulge that uh, is involved in recruiting EIF4G. And if you remember, EIF4G, like I mentioned on that first slide, was the next eukaryotic initiation factor that binds to that start that goes on to the dog pile after you've got the cap binding protein. So essentially what this is doing is that it's removing the need for the EIF for E eukaryotic initiation factor and uh, allowing the dog pile to begin with fewer eukaryotic initiation factors than normal. And so the virus could potentially shut off cap-dependent translation and, and it would still be able to translate its own sequence in the cell. So with EIF4G coming in here, you bring in all the other EIFs as well as the small subunit of, of the ribosome in that ternary complex that we've talked about before. It scans over, finds the start site, then the large subunit would get recruited in and you get translation at the start site. So viruses have found a way to get around a typical cellular process with the idea that they can shut down the normal cellular process yet still get their proteins being made. Pretty, uh, pretty sneaky, these viruses. Everything you learn about how a cell normally works, the cool thing about viruses is that you find out viruses tweak the system and uh, figure out their own way, not to anthropomorphize, but anyway. Then we come along and we understand these iris sequences and we can use them to our own benefit. So this slide is stealing ideas from mother nature. So this is an example of an RNA that would be made in a cell that has a typical cap and then it has one open reading frame that expresses a fluorescent protein. In this case, I have green fluorescent protein. I think if I remember back to my graduate school days, it was actually a yellow fluorescent protein, but you can put whatever color you want in. It has a start and a stop. So the ribosome uh, would be recruited in, or all the eukaryotic initiation factors would be recruited into that cap. You'd get scanning, you'd make the GFP, and the ribosome would fall off. We have a second open reading frame that codes for a protein here and I've labeled it NSP1. That's this protein I studied for graduate school. And it has its own start and stop and in front of it we've got an iris. And so the translation machinery can be recruited independently internally to this uh, so that you can get translation that's independent of that cap, get NSP1 being made and here's the NSP1 protein being made. This was a major stumbling block when we were trying to understand how this protein works is getting an RNA that the cell would make plenty of protein for us. Once you make the protein, uh, then the idea was figure out what that protein did. And we were able to, along with a couple other labs in the world, figure out a couple different ways where this rotavirus non-structural protein one can block the uh, interferon response. And so if a virus blocks an interferon response, you are limiting the ability of the cells to defend themselves against viruses. So that was what my grad school project was all about. Um, I just want to point to this. Oh, there are lots of different viruses that have internal ribosomal entry sites. The interesting thing about, or the, this particular one that I told you about from polio, recruits in EIF4G, so you've only taken one eukaryotic initiation factor out of the loop. There are other virus irises, that, uh, such as the cricket paralysis virus, that its iris is able to recruit the ribosomes, almost like the shine delgarno sequence is able to just recruit the ribosomes, and it actually doesn't require any of the 20 or so eukaryotic initiation factors that we we talked about um, piling on and scanning and all that stuff. It just brings the ribosome right into the start site.
alternative start site for cricket paralysis virus. But anyway, different irises have different properties and different those different properties can change what is required to be recruited to get translation initiation started. So these have been a great tool for understanding eukaryotic translation. All right, my virus has an iris. There you go. Like and subscribe or not.